Hello? <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody out there in the YouTube world. This is your teacher, Mr. Jose here, and I'm going to teach you a little bit about why World War I, yep, that's right, buddy, World War I, why that was such an interesting experience on the home front. Mm, okay, let's begin. Now, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, at the start, when we joined World War I, remember, we spent the first two, three years trying to stay out of this thing, in April, suddenly, we are unprepared. Our soldiers don't exist. The little soldiers that are in the army and military are untrained, and so we have a draft. And I'm sure most of you have seen kind of these, at least the one probably with the I want you for the U.S. Army, you have the propaganda posters trying to get people to join the military. The Selective Service Act in May says if you are ages 18 and whatever it went up to, 25, 30, doesn't really matter, that you have to register. And what that means is you put your name in, you go to the war office, the war register board, as these guys are doing, and you could get called. Most people who fought in World War I were not drafted they volunteered, but some were. Now, here's the thing. If you think about what you need to fight a war, the most obvious one is people. And then you'll probably think about things like guns or uniforms or shoes or socks or really kind of obvious ones. But think about all the things people don't think about. You need training. You need strategy. You need tactics. You need food, not just for the soldiers off fighting, but your allies the people who are at home. You need fuel. You need a lot of things. You need metal, rubber, all sorts of materials, ammo. You need a purpose. And that's important. You need people to believe with their hearts and their minds that the war is worth fighting. And so one of the things that we did today is you looked at a song that's purpose was to make people feel patriotic, to make people feel proud of being American, to make people want to go and fight. And if you look at the lyrics of the song, it's all about this idea, this kid, young man, Johnny, wanting to make his family proud, his daddy glad, his sweetheart happy, and his mom and all that stuff. Make your mother proud of you in the old red, white, and blue. And the way he's going to do that is he's going to go and fight. Now, if you look at your worksheet that you did, the one generalization that I want you to realize about the federal government is, unlike today, the government did things to try to get people to want to support the war. And it does this through regulations. Regulators. You regulate any stealing of his property. We're damn good, too. But you can't be any geek off the street. Oh, no. Gotta be, be handy with the seal. You know what I mean? Here you keep. Watch this. Regulators! You need regulation. In fact, if you look at the first page of your worksheet, each one of those boxes is an example of a government agency which purpose was to regulate society or oversee society to make sure the government was mobilizing the people for the war effort. So you, you're not just going to hope that everything works out. During World War I, it is a total war. Total war means the war is not just on the battlefield, it's also on the home front. So if you look at your sheet, you have all these agencies, and they're really easy to remember because their titles kind of tell you what they're going to do. For example, the, the War Industry Board regulates industry, so it makes sure companies produce things that are for the war effort, rather than things that are not necessary at the time. Scarce resources, standardized production. Also, you have, what are you going to do about food? The regulation. The Food Administration, headed by a president that you'll learn about next semester, Herbert Hoover. It makes sure that production and allocation of certain goods, like wheat or meat, ooh, they rhyme, sugar, are adequately available for both the Allies and our troops. You have the Fuel Administration. 
which controls fuel consumption to make sure that people don't use too much so that we have enough for the war effort. We actually institute around the entire country daylight savings time during World War I so that it's light longer so you're using more or less rather resources. What if there's a strike during the war in the factories? You don't want that to happen so you have the regulation. War Labor Board. So if there's a labor dispute that will interrupt the production, the government will try to mediate and negotiate a resolution. So all of these things were done during World War I. The government power is increasing in an attempt to fight the war more efficiently. In fact, you don't just hope people are going to want to do this. You need to convince people to do this. And that's where governments, and not just governments, but companies do something to try to convince people to do things, and that is where you come up with propaganda. And the whole purpose of that is to manipulate and form public opinion. You want people to say, you know what, I'm going to eat less sugar. I'm going to use less fuel. I'm not going to buy certain things that take up a lot of metal or, or steel so that it can go for the war effort. And if you look, and like I said, this is the quickest version of World War I at home that you're going to see. You have, for example, posters, because you don't have TV or, you know, big production movies like we have today, but you have these, these posters. These are all posters created. You see the U.S. Food Administration at the bottom. What is it trying to get people to do? Food. In fact, notice the symbolism there. You got the George Washington looking guy right in the middle. It just happens to be using patriotic images. You have this one, which is kind of, you know, really kind of basic, but save sugar. I love this one. If you want to defeat the Kaiser, the leader of Germany is called the Kaiser. If you want to can the Kaiser, what could you do? Can food. Wow. Isn't that clever, right? You're going to can the Kaiser by canning your food because by canning your food, you're saving food. Another one, very dramatic imagery. So there's all di sorts of different techniques for propaganda. Here's one showing these dramatic images with the people starving, look like zombies trying to attack this family, and the children are just bony-armed looking for a scrap of food. Even children can help out in the war effort by planting gardens. So, you know, all these are examples of the way people were mobilized during World War I to help out. My favorite poster, because it's so weird, is this one. <laughs> the reason why I think this is weird is, um, this is from the U.S. Fuel Administration. It's obviously wanting people to, you know, save and conserve fuel. The thing I like about it, or rather the thing that disturbs me deeply, <laughs> is what the heck is Uncle Sam doing to this man in the poster? He's either doing a number of things. I'll only say one because the other ones, ooh, I don't even want to think about. He's caressing his muscles. And look at the grin or the odd face he has on. What's going on here? I don't know, but I have to move on because it's making me feel weird. Real basic poster right there. U.S. Fuel Administration, save gas. It's a war necessity. So all of this is propaganda that is designed to get people to do things during World War I. You heard the song. We saw the song. The lyrics of the song. The lyrics of the song. Sing it at home when you're bored. <coughs> they also do things. And that is promoting the war and making sure people don't resist the war, which we'll talk about in another lecture. And one of the things that's created is the Committee on Public Information, headed by George Creel. Committee on Public Information, the whole purpose of it was to make people support the war. And the way you do that is you produce things. Patriotic messages, ads, posters, news releases, silent films, to make people proud. Make them want to go over there. So you have this being done. It's deliberate. It's planned. It's being done by the government. Now this is, of course, you know, not without controversy, which we'll get into a little later. And once again, 
They produce a lot of posters. They want people to buy war bonds, liberty loans. I'll tell you what that is in just a moment. They want people to enlist in the military. And one of the ways you do that is you demonize the enemy. You make the Germans and the enemy seem so barbaric, so horrible, that you want to go and fight them. You have, here's another one of my favorites, wanting people to buy liberty bonds, help crush the menace of the seas. Remember what was going on with German U-boats. So you want people to be angry. You want them to give money to the war effort. Kind of a boring one about, what is this about? <laughs> something, like if you have an owl, we eat an apple or something. I don't know. And you'll see in the video I'm going to show you in just a moment, you're going to have silent films. And in the silent films, the Huns, the derogatory term for the Germans, they were depicted as uh, just really, really bad. And we needed to fight them. And you're going to get all sorts of reactions to this. In fact, Wilson said, it's not an army we must shape and train for war. It is a nation. It's not just the soldiers that you need to prepare. It's not just the guns. You need people to believe what the nation is going through is worth sacrificing for. This guy's kind of like the Brad Pitt of World War I. And I say that because he was an actor. He was famous. He was a handsome dude, Douglas Fairbanks. And you'll see him in this photo. You have tons of people waiting around, listening to him speak, and he's trying to get people to buy something. And what that thing is, are bonds. War bonds. In fact, two-thirds of the war was paid for what were known uh, as liberty loans or war bonds. And basically it is citizens, individuals, it could be old ladies, kids, adults, whoever, giving money, loans to the government, and that money was going to go and help fight the war. And you got two propaganda, great propaganda posters showing that kind of dramatic appealing to people to buy the war bond. Now what happens, on the back side of your worksheet, you read about that there was a lot of intolerance during World War I. If you were an immigrant, especially a German immigrant, if you were someone who had radical ideas, if you were someone who was against the war, you found that there was a heightened sense of paranoia. <laughs> In fact, this paranoia became very real. There were examples of German-born people lynched. One of them was Robert Prager. He was lynched by an angry mob because of his German background. In many towns and cities and schools, German language was no longer taught. Books were banned. Music was banned. All sorts of things. And like I said, if you did anything to question the war, you were perceived with suspicion, and in some cases you were arrested under laws like the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act actually made it illegal to speak out against the war. Now the wildest thing about this is, if you could think about how paranoid and intolerant America was during World War I, what is the most famous German thing in America? <laughs> Hitler. Isn't it the sausage? Food. Think food. Sausage. No, not necessarily sausage. I guess, you know, the sausage, but it, it's Hamburger. Oh, yeah. If you go to Germany, there is a city called Hamburg, German. Hamburg, hamburgers, is a German word. And during World War I, hamburgers were renamed Liberty Sandwiches. Oh, my God. As a way to kind of separate ourselves from the German culture. Now, oh my God. is that real? That is real. <laughs> So I thought to myself, what is the biggest hamburger ever made? So I got on my little Google. Oh, Wendy. That was 805 pounds of hamburger. It is the world record, and it was made not in Germany, in America. This is Wendy's, right? Not Wendy's. No, it's not Wendy's. It's a store. Uh, it's a restaurant in New Jersey. Uh, the guy's wearing the hat because I guess he's the king because he made it. To give you some perspective... That is, uh, that is the world record hamburger with 105 pounds, and there is one of the regular burgers at this restaurant. 
So if you're ever, if you're into the world of competitive eating, uh, no one person ate this. That would be ridiculous and probably impossible, guaranteed impossible. I don't think any human being can eat 105 pounds of food. Uh, but there it is. Now, a couple other things, real quickly. Farmers actually did really well during World War I because they're growing food not just for the Americans, but also for the Allies. But they had to borrow a lot of money to do this. That will be important in the next unit. The economy was actually doing really well during World War I because we're producing things not just for America, but also the Allies. So you have new jobs being created. Income is raising. In fact, this is going to impact different groups. For instance, African Americans are going to have a variety of experiences during World War I. For one, if you recall, in America, especially in the South, life was segregated. Jim Crow laws, Plessy versus Ferguson, separation. You gotta keep them separated. That was still going on. In, in spite of the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, and those individuals, segregation still existed, in the South especially. Now here's the wild thing about it. Many, many, many African Americans volunteered to go fight for the United States of America and here they are going over to France in a ship on their way to fight for, remember what Wilson said, to make the world safe for democracy. And these African Americans who went to fight for America in spite of their bravery, courage, and sacrifice were... You gotta keep them separated. Forced to fight in segregated units. In fact, Americans, the military is going to be segregated even in World War II. It will end after World War II. Our militaries will no longer be segregated by race. So it's a wild thing to think about. But there were opportunities for African Americans. For one, to go fight and prove your bravery and courage and sacrifice for the country that was doing these things to an entire group of people. But the real opportunity came in the North. Because when World War I began, European immigration stops. And remember what immigrants were doing. They were working in factories. And part of the thing that happened is many, many men went off to go fight in war, and you need people to go work in factories. So African-American people start getting opportunities in war industries. And most African-Americans at this time, about two-thirds, live in the South where Jim Crow exists. So during World War I, you have this mass migration of people up to the north called the Great Migration, moving on up geographically. We're moving on up, moving on up to the east side. In the deepest apartment in the sky. Up, 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 up. At this great migration, 500,000 African American people will go from the South to the North looking for jobs, partly to escape Southern racism, to get new opportunities. This is a family heading to Chicago. This is a famous painting by Jacob Lawrence kind of <coughs> depicting the great migration. The movement of people, a mass movement, this lighter blue shows some of the cities, especially New York, but also Boston, Philly, Detroit, Chicago. Tons of African Americans are moving north. Now, for those of you that were thinking, woo, this is going to be a happy ending. Everything's going to be great because there's no racism in the north. Wrong. In fact, race riots break out in northern cities. And African American people are targeted by violent mobs who are not happy that their cities and neighborhoods are changing. And there is a tremendous amount, even though it's not segregation, Jim Crow, where there's laws, there is de facto discrimination in the North. It's unofficial discrimination, but there are race riots. The last part of the home front is the role women play. And if you remember, we already talked about women during World War I when the suffrage movement, especially Alice Paul, began to protest President Wilson during the war. How are you going to give democracy to the world when women don't have it at home, President Wilson, was kind of the idea. And women play a bunch of roles during the war. One, men are gone fighting. Women do a lot of things that normally women could not have the opportunity to do. Here are some. 
So all these different jobs, whether it be um, kind of jobs that typically were available for women, uh, such as receptionists and nurses, working with groups like the Red Cross or the YMCA or the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association, or working in factories, doing jobs that typically were considered man's work, women do them, which is one of the reasons why it becomes hard for the nation to ignore the contributions of women. And finally, women's suffrage is granted with the 19th Amendment. And once again, you have a lot of these posters, these propaganda posters, showing the different ways women contributed as, you know, receptionists in different assignments in the factories. These women are doing their bit, learn to make munitions, as women who are helping produce food for the nation, as women who are, I love this one, hey, guys, Gee, I wish I were a man. I joined the Navy. This kind of peer pressure. You know, she, this cute, bubbly young woman, she wishes she could join, but she can't, and you're a man and you're not, so better join. And you got grandma right here, right? Buy Liberty Loans. Anybody can help out, help America's sons win the war. And the interesting, odd image here. I don't know if this is a Red Cross spider woman. She's like shooting her web out with her fingers or what's going on with her hands, but she's reaching out for you all to study the contributions of people on the home front. Study, study, study. 